Hello and welcome to the first video in the series on sit and goes, introducing a sit and goes, things that you need to do to maximise your profits in sit and goes, and just generally an overview of sit and goes. I'm Al McLennan, I play as MD261 on PokerStars, and I've been joined by Tom Loose Boy Loose. Hi Al. And in this video, what we're going to look at is what makes sit and go special? You know, what what strategic differences do I have to make in my play when I'm playing a sit and go as opposed to when I'm playing a multi table tournament or a cash game? What types of sit and go should I look to play? How I should tailor my play to maximize my profits and the standard errors that, that you see made. And I don't mean the errors that you see fish make, I mean the ones that you see a lot of regs make. And they're understandable errors, but they're also ones which cost you money. So I think first of all we should probably introduce ourselves. Uh, I play as MD261 on PokerStars. Tom plays as Loose Boy on PokerStars. And we've both done a lot of coaching for people of, of various ranges, from, from good pros to uh, beginners at sixmaxcoaching.com. We've also staked people there. And both Tom and I have made videos for juicescrack.com and pokersavvyplus.com. So what are the main differences from the sit and go to MTTs and cash games? Well it really all boils down to ICM, the independent chip model. All the strategic differences that we're going to talk about come from the idea that ICM applies in a sit and go. What ICM basically means is chips are not equal to money. In a cash game, if you have bought £5 worth of chips, your chips are worth £5, regardless of what else is going on at the table. That doesn't work like that in a sit and go, and the, and the reason for that is that if you win all the chips in a sit and go, if you have every single chip, you don't win 100% of the prize pool. In a six man sit and go, first and second place will split the prize pool 65% to 35%. And in a nine man, it will be split 50, 30, 20. And that can create some very strange things. It doesn't just matter about how many chips you win, it's about how far you survive. So the chips don't equal money, and a move that will win you chips does not mean that it will win you money. And that is an important difference. It doesn't matter about winning chips. I'm guessing that the reason you play poker isn't to win chips, but is to win money. And because there's a, you get paid just for coming in the prizes without necessarily winning you know you can bust out of the sit and go in second place and still get some money there's a lot of benefit to just surviving what that means is if you want to risk a large amount of chips and get involved in a big pot you need a big edge because if you double up you don't double your money equity even if you double your chips so don't build a big pot in a sit and go early on unless you really do expect to win the pot and also this strange ICM factor can create very strange things on the bubble. Um, there can be situations where it is correct to fold a hand like queens even when you think your opponent is shoving 100%. They're rare, they're unusual, they don't come across very often, but they can happen and you always want to do what will win you the most money rather than the most chips. So you need to be aware that when you get to the bubble, which is three-handed in a six-man sit and go, four-handed in a nine-man, some very strange dynamics can be in place which can mean that you should make what will seem like very strange adjustments to your play. And really the difference between top sit and go pros, the most profitable sit and go pros and others is not just understanding that ICM exists but understanding how to adjust your play at all stages of a sit and go because of ICM. What kind of sit and goes should you play? Because there's lots of different ones out there. You've got different speeds, you've got different types, you've got different formats, you've got different number of players, you've got heads up, 6 man, 9 man, 18 man, 45 man, 180 man, although 180 man is closer to an MTT in many ways. You've got regular speed, turbo speed, hyper turbo, double or nothing, 50-50s, knockouts, jackpots, matrixes, there's loads of different ones out there. And uh, each one of them is going to require, you know, a different style of play. I mean, they're own, each to their own. They're little niches, and in a way, even though they may look fairly simple, um, in order to maximise the money, amount of money you're going to make at each one of them, you're going to have to make some adjustments depending on, you know, the blind structure, the payouts, 
etc., uh, etc. Et like for instance, quite how you play a double or nothing is going to be very different to how you play um, a hyper turbo heads up. Absolutely. I mean, there's, and there's pros and cons to each of these. You know, we will find that people who play one kind swear by it often. If you're a nine-man pro, you'll find people will only tell you the pros of nine-man. You can play lots of tables, it's about your cards, you just make, take advantage of other people's mistakes, there's no meta game, and blah, blah, blah. Yet you talk to a six-man pro and he'll say, you're a better player, there's less players there, there's more time for your skill edge to come into play because everyone has to play more hands. The reality of it is, there's pros and cons to each of these. The important thing is that you just find one and specialise in it. It may be nice to be a jack of all trades and to be able to play all these different kinds of games, but if you're playing poker to win money, it makes sense to find one, get as profitable at it as you can be, and that will maximise how much money you will make. If um, you're playing more recreationally, it's different. I would just say, I mean, the only tournament I would avoid playing in terms of sit and goes is that one sit and go where you start off with one chip and you're automatically all in. Because I'm not sure that you can get a positive ROI here. It's very hard to have an edge. Although, having said that, a lot of fish play it, so maybe. Uh, just to clarify, we are joking. You definitely do not want to play that tournament where you're automatically all in. That is the most retarded sitting go, and, you know, I don't know why anyone plays it, for being honest. People love a gamble. Okay, so how are we going to look at all these things that we've talked about? Well, we're just going to pick one sitting go, go through it, in relation to all the things that we've looked at and show how your stand, your style of play should be a bit different in a sit and go towards other things, other types of games, how ICM affects your decisions, how it changes the style of play at each of the different stages and the, just the general factors that you want to consider. Now the problem with trying to play all of them is, is that all these different kinds of sit and goes, they have different prize structures, they have different payouts and this means that ICM works differently for each one. So we're going to look at some broad general concepts. It's worth pointing out that these may not apply to all of them. A lot of general concepts are good, but I wouldn't take as gospel what you're going to see in the analysis here, which is going to be a normal 6 max sit and go and say, well that means I can do exactly the same thing in a 50-50, because you definitely can't. So rather than try and just cover all the bases and make a video which isn't really too useful for anyone, we're going to just look at a 6 max sit and go and look at that in depth and see how ICM affects your decision in this structure of tournament. So for the actual hand review part of this video, the format we're going to take is we're just going to look at hands where there's something that can be learnt from it, there's some interesting point which we can take from it. There's no point looking at a hand like this one here where you have four king of suit under the gun because there's only one thing that you're going to want to do, put it in the muck. And any time there's a hand like that, we're just going to skip through it. Now you may think, well, you know, what happens if it comes to you in the blinds? Well, the thing is, the hand will be totally standard. If we skip past the hand, there won't be anything that you've missed out on, so don't worry about that. So the first hand of any note is this Ace-10 of suit. And this is a really good example of a, a difference between a cash game and a sit-and-go. We, you know, we've talked about how in a cash game your chips are your money, so anything that will win you chips will win you money. Whereas in a sit and go, because of the fact that there is a prize structure, you can make money without even necessarily winning the tournament. You know, the person who ends up with all the chips at the end of a sit and go on PokerStars only wins 65% of the prize pool. There's actually a big premium in surviving, which is why you want to play big pots with big hands. And this is an interesting spot here. And Tom, what do you think about this? Well, obviously, um, you've got Ace-10 off suit. Um, it's a, a premium hand, um, although at the lower end of the scale. And realistically, you'd want to you'd raise with it if you were first in. However, you're in the big blind, and you've had a limp from the button. And although your Ace-10 off suit stands to be well ahead of his limping range, considering his, um, his HUD stats of 32-13, there are obviously reasons why you'd want to raise. I mean, your hand does, like I said, stand to be ahead of his limping range. But then again... You don't necessarily want to build or start to build um, a big pot out of position at the early blinds. Indeed, and I would say that it's very, very often the case when the blinds are low. The kind of person who limps on the button tends to be a fish, and the fish is the kind of person who just looks at it as an overall amount of chips. So, unless you're willing to raise it eight times a big blind, or, you know, 160, chances are whatever you raise it to, if it's any kind of reasonable amount, you're just going to get cool and you'll be building a pot 
out of position. A fish who limps on the button is unlikely to fold unless you raise a large hand, and your hand isn't quite big enough to build a big pot to risk raising a big amount. To me, I mean, this is one of those spots where, you know, you, you can make a really good case for raising, but it just won't actually help you necessarily in this spot. You'd much rather exercise a bit of pot control. And the other advantage is taking a line like this is a little bit simpler, which will mean you have to spend less time thinking, which will let you play more tables, which will increase how much money you make per hour as a, as a poker player. In terms of the hands that you'd want to raise here, I would say probably nines plus and ace queen, maybe ace jack. But most of the time with a big ace here, if you do raise, it's likely you're going to get called by the guy who limped the button, in which case you're almost certainly going to make some sort of C-bet blind, no matter what the flop is. Um, and at that point, you'll have put in, you know, 120, 150 chips with probably just ace high. So yeah. it, it's, not, it's not the best situation. Um, obviously, you know, you are out of position, so that is one other reason to raise, but it's also a reason not to bloat the pot pre-flop. What I would say with this hand is check in the big blind, uh, and if you hit a top pair with an ace or a ten, uh, you can bet it strongly for value. And it will be concealed value, because people will have been thinking that if you had a hand this strong, you would have raised. So it works quite well like that. I will just touch upon a point that Tom made, which said, he said, you know, you're out of position, so there's more reason to raise. And it's worth explaining exactly what that means. And, and when you're out of position, you're at a disadvantage for every street of the hand. On every street, your opponent will get to see what you do first. Which is why, generally, when you're out of position, you want to raise larger amounts and be more inclined to raise, because if you raise large, you have a chance of taking down the pot earlier, which means that your opponent has less of a positional advantage. If he folds pre-flop, he has no positional advantage, which is why he said, generally, you want to be more inclined to raise hand out of position than in position, where in position, flat calling can often be a good option. So, checking here is a good move. I realise now that we haven't actually explain the HUD. Um, some people will be very familiar with HUD, some people will not. Uh, both Tom and I use a fairly complicated HUD which would just be completely confusing, a massive jumble of numbers. So we've got a simple one here. Simply VPIP, how often someone has voluntarily put money in the pot as a percentage, so completed from the small blind, limped in, called a preflop raise, but not checking the big blind. It's generally an indication of how loose someone is. Uh, and then we've got pre-flop raise, which is pretty obvious how often they raise it pre-flop or re-raise it pre-flop. And then aggression factor. And aggression factor is the percentage of bets and raises compared to checks and calls. It's the, the ratio. Yeah. If it's a low number, your opponent's likely to be fairly passive and he's going to call you down and check when you check. If it's aggressive, he's going to bet and raise a lot more. It's worth saying that any aggression factor number above two or three is particularly aggressive. And anything below one is considered, you know, particularly passive. Yeah, you will not find a good reg with an aggression factor of less than, say, 1.5. Very unlikely. So, I mean, just, just as a last thought, if you were going to raise with a ace 10, you would want to make it, I would say, uh, at least 60. I would think 60 is too small. It gives the guy who limped the button pretty good odds to call. So you want to make it 80 or potentially even 100. Exactly, which is kind of part of the reason to just check in many ways. Um, and this is uh, the very interesting thing. People often think, well, I've hit my ace, it's concealed, time to check and let him bet. But that's not how it works in sit and goes at all. In sit and goes, when you have a good hand and you're deep stacked, you don't slow play. You pretty much never slow play when you're deep stacked in a sit and go. It's, you just bet and bet and bet. The advantage is that you check and you have a concealed hand. No one's going to put you on a hand of this strength. It's important to bet. If you check, the button is likely going to bet, and you do not know whether he is betting because everyone's checked to him, whether he's betting because he's got a better hand than you, whether he's betting because he's got an okay hand. You basically get no information from him, yet you give away a lot of information about your own hand when you check raise because he's very likely to think you have a very strong hand. And unfortunately, check calling isn't really an option because you're going to, you want to build the pot now, you want to make the pot as large as possible, really. So this is why it's important to bet, because you can, in many ways, conceal the strength of your own hand. He could think, well, maybe he's just betting because it's a weak, you know, a weak board. Maybe he's got a pair of fours. Maybe he's got a gut shot, a straight draw. Whereas when you check raise, people tend to put you on something strong. I think it's also worth saying that, obviously, you know, it is a value bet. Your hand at the moment, top pair with a 10 kicker, stands to be best considering he limped the button. You would have thought he would have raised if he had a bigger ace than you. So at this point in time, you think you definitely have the best hand, therefore you should definitely bet. 
in addition, betting makes your decisions further on the hand a lot easier because, for one, he has to do something that will tell you a great deal about his hand. If he raises, you know, you can probably think that he's got an ace and you can play the hand accordingly. There is obviously the danger he might fold, but then again, may well have limped a weak ace on the button, in which case, you know, you're going to get some solid value from this hand. Yeah, the ideal way this hand goes down is bet call, bet call, bet call. He shows down a five, which is a hand that people are likely to limp, and then having checked your hand preflop, turns out to be very profitable. And what Tom said, making your decision decisions a lot simpler, making your hands simpler to play, means they require less thought, which means you don't have to spend as much time on them, which means you can actually play more tables at once, which is important for increasing your hourly rate. So, on the flop, stick out a bet. Unfortunately, you get two folds, but in poker, it's decisions which matter, not results. If you always thought, oh, he folded there, I should have checked, you'll end up playing with no kind of cohesion, no strategy. You want to bet out there. He folded this time. Oh, well. And in terms of the bet size, somewhere in the region of half the pot or slightly larger. I would say, you know, I prefer 40 there, but 30 is fine. Yeah, yeah, 40 would be absolutely fine. Particularly if the board was wetter, you definitely want to make it a bit, a bit larger. And by a wet board, I mean one with a few more draws. And this is a really good hand. This is a really interesting hand because um, I see a lot of people perhaps maybe playing these hands not as well as they could. It's, it's very tempting to think, well, that guy's clearly a fish. Look at his VPIP at 45%. He's raised it. I've got ace 10. I certainly want to get involved here. But there's no good way to get involved here. He's raised it large enough that you don't really want to just call because your immediate pot odds are so bad. Also, his preflop raise percentage of 18% isn't necessarily that high. It may be that you're behind most of his range. And it, while it is true that he could be raising with a hand like ace-8 or ace-9, just as likely he could be raising with, or even more likely, raising with ace-jack, ace-queen, ace-king. And the problem is you're not going to be happy with your hand. You're not going to be happy if you hit an ace because although you could be ahead of him, there's more chance you're actually behind him and you're not going to be able to bet for value because you may just be value betting yourself. Furthermore, you're out of position, and he doesn't raise enough for you to really want to re-raise because he looks like he's got a strong hand. So what would you be looking to do here, Tom? Well, I mean, I'd say the biggest factor here is you are out of position. He has raised it five times the blind. Considering the stack size and the fact you're at the early blinds, you really only want to be getting involved when, you know, you've got a premium hand, in which case you want to be looking to be raising first in, or you want to be getting involved when you've got a hand that plays well, multi-way, in a in a you know a pot with multiple limpers, for instance, you could limp on the button with uh, with ace five suited or a pocket pair. That would be perfect. In this situation, ace ten off suit. It's likely to just have ace high on the flop. It doesn't play well or doesn't play that well post flop. You're going to be out of position and you're not the pre flop raiser. You're going to find it very very tough to play post flop. So you know, even though it looks like it might be playable. Yeah, it's often best here to just fold. If the guy who'd raised had a stack size of maybe 250, I might consider re-raising. But mm. considering he's got quite a lot behind, I would say a fold here is probably prudent. That's true. The deeper stacked you are, the more you have to worry about getting involved with a dominated second best hand. In poker, you win a lot for having the best hand, you lose very little for having the worst hand, but having the second best hand can make you lose as many chips as possible. So the deeper stack they are, the more, more you have to be concerned about getting involved with a hand that might be dominated because you might lose a lot of chips. In addition, if you had a hand such as ace-king or ace-queen here, you're in a little bit of a difficult situation because with a hand like ace-king, you would definitely want to re-raise to negate your positional disadvantage. But re-raising means that you have to commit probably, you know, 900 chips. Or at least if you're going to re-raise, you want to make it so that you know, it's clear to him that you know, you're willing to take him all in. So you want to re-raise to say something like 400. Mm -hmm. That puts you in the same kind of situation where you're likely to just have ace high on the flop. So even though I, you know, if I had ace king here, I might just still call. Because the blinds are so low and you are so deep stacked, you don't necessarily want to risk so much. You know, your, your edge wouldn't be great enough, even with ace-king, against this opponent at these blind levels to warrant you putting in 900 chips pre-flop, you know, 45 big blinds. So with a hand like ace-king or ace-queen, I may call and then opt to, you know, check-raise a flop if I hit big. Yep, seems reasonable.
And so, we get round to the next hand. You're on the button, 8-7 suited, and this is a great hand when you're deep stacked, when you're in position, when you want to balance your range, because it's a hand that isn't technically a strong hand, but it plays well when deep stacked. And by that I mean, you know, if you have a hand like Ace-Jack, or, or Ace-King, or Pocket Aces even, when you've got only 20 or 25 big blinds, you're really happy. You get to raise it up, you get to chunk someone's stack in, you get to win a nice big pot. However, when you're really deep stacked, often at the end of the hand, you'll only end up with one pair, a pair of aces. And, and when you're really deep stacked and lots of chips have had to go in, you'll often find that that isn't, isn't the best hand. One pair is rarely the best hand in a big pot. However, 8-7 suited can really help you hit those hands, which you can get involved very deep, and you can hit a flush, you can hit a straight, and it helps to balance your range. It's the kind of hand people can't really put you on as well. So I'm very much of the idea that you can get involved with hands like these early on. Particularly, you know, if someone else had limped, I would have suggested limping behind. Uh, if someone else had raised, I would suggest folding. But when it's folded around to you, on the button, maybe even on the cutoff, it's worth raising. And another point to think of is, look at the HUD stats of these two players. They both look fairly tight. So you have a good chance of taking down the pot pre-flop. That's something you should definitely be thinking about any time you consider making a raise in late position. Um, you know, you should be looking at the blinds as well as the strength of your hand. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that you always have to raise here with a hand like 7-8 suited. Um, but True. if you are playing 6 max, you know, it's probably because you generally like to get involved and it is a hand that you can raise profitably on the button or in the cutoff. Absolutely. And then we get re-raise here and... This is an interesting situation. In general, I would say that most of the time you want to fold here because his range looks super strong. On the other hand, his range does look super strong. He may well have that big pair we're talking about, and we just said that 8-7 suited is a hand that, that does well against that. Having said that, there would be nothing wrong with folding here. I think I would generally look to fold now. The only reason I don't hear is actually something which may not be apparent, but the opponent is uh, a reg. And as he is a rake, he knows how I like to raise on the button. He will have noticed that the big blind is tight, and he will have expected me to raise a very wide range. So I think that this isn't a bad hand in terms of balancing my range so that he can't think that he can just 3-bet me all the time and I'll fold. I think here, I would probably lay down a hand like Ace-Jack of Suit, but I would be more inclined to call with a hand like 8-7 Suited here. Um, but you have to be entirely comfortable playing it post-flop in order to be able to make this call. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, the most important uh, first thing I want to say is uh, I don't want to suggest that calling here is actually better than folding because it may well be that folding is the best option. It's, it's not one of, those, one of those decisions where you can make a strong case either way. And it's only I can only go either way on it because I am very comfortable playing post-flop. And if you're not 100% comfortable with it, you should go, well, that probably tips it over the edge to make it so that it's better for me to just fold. No, I would say I would say 95% of the time here you should fold. There yeah. are very few circumstances where you can afford to get involved in a heads-up pop with 7-8 suited for, uh, you know, after a 3-bet. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think perhaps folding would have been the better option here. I prefer folding, but, you know... Looking at it now, I think I do. But it is still close, um... But I think, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, folding's probably best. And after the flop, you're not, you're not really involved to try and mess about. The guy has shown some strength. You've got eight high. Your gut shot's not exactly what you're looking for. Time to throw it in the muck. I, I think the point is, obviously, you know, it is the early blinds. You have a hand that plays well multi-way, but you're not in a multi-way pot, and your pot odds aren't great considering he's three bet. So, you know, you're, you're looking for a flop that either gives you two pair trips or some sort of draw, in which case you're going to have to call about on the flop um, and you know, you'll be calling off quite a lot of your chips I mean and like you said it is good to balance your range but at the early blinds I'm not so sure that so many regs will be deviating from standard sit and go practice of you know literally just play, uh, playing premium hands yep when you're right you're right and it sounds like you're right there I agree and so we get to pocket aces and this is a hand that is most commonly misplayed. Uh, you see, you see it misplayed all the time. And with the exception of the top top regs, who play, got a lot of experience, I would say most players misplay aces. I think it's really common, and for some reason, you can have a player who can play really pretty sound game, pretty solid with most hands, but suddenly they get aces and they think, all right, different rules apply. These are aces. I can't play them like I would any other hand. Well, 
The one thing I'll say about aces is, when you're deep stacked, you play them hard and fast and you never slow play, and it's for the reasons we alluded to with 8-7 suited. They, aces are the nut hand right now pre-flop. You would happily get it all in, even if every single player went all in, because they're the best hand possible. But on the flop, they're generally just a pair, and on the river, they're still generally just a pair, because they're unlikely to improve. And if you're getting to a big pot on the river, with just one pair, there's a good chance you're beaten. So you need to bet hard and fast, bet really strong so you charge people to get there. You don't want to slow play. You never want to slow play in a sit and go when you're deep stacked. Uh, I can't actually think of a single occasion when you would. Um, I mean, there might be a cup, maybe if you had an enormous fishbowl who just loved to just keep on betting with air. But that's really rare, I would say. As a general rule, never slow play deep stacked when you have a strong hand. What do you think? I hate slow play. Yep. So a full 3x raise, absolutely. Uh, and you get called and, yep, I think at least this amount to bet. Well, I'd say, you know, that kind of board, Queen-10-3, there's quite a lot of gut shots out there. In addition to, you know, there being you know, him hitting a lot of pairs with his calling range. So when I bet here, I'd be looking to bet more like 120 or 150 because I think there's a lot of hands that would call a bet here. Yep. And you do want to charge them. Absolutely, but I can think that. 105 is fine. Now, you know, it's very tempting to have the mindset of, I've got pocket aces, I don't want him to fold, I'll keep him on the hook. Which is, um, you know, if you're doing that, all you're doing is thinking about yourself and your own hand. Poker is a game of, of humans playing humans. So you need to look and think, well, if I bet 150, say, is he going to fold a pair of 10s? Is he going to fold a pair of queens? Is he going to fold an open-ended straight draw? The answer is undoubtedly no. Um, yes, he may fold those completely junk hands like ace five, but then again, you're probably not going to get much value from them anyway. So you do want to bet strong here because there's lots of hands that can call your strong bet, and then you can continually get value from them. Well, he folds there. Just to say, I mean, most people who check there in the big blind, you know, are expecting you to bet. So when they check, they're either going to check fold or they're going to check raise. I would say, you know, generally, that's that's the case. Um, if someone does check raise there and you have aces, I suppose it does obviously depend on the player, but your, your options are to, to re-raise back, try and get it all in on the flop, um, as that's you know a, a pretty good flop view. You're going to assume that he's probably got a hand like queen-king uh, or maybe ace-queen. It's unlikely he's got a set or two pair, so you don't really have to be worried about that. Or you know if you're against a particularly aggressive player, you could opt to just call his check raise on the flop and then, assuming he bets the turn, raise him then. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's worth pointing out is the guy does have a reasonably low uh, aggression factor, which, which may imply that he might check call rather than check raising. But the point is indeed correct. When he checks, he's expecting you to bet. It's not like when you bet, he goes, hang on a second, he, MD2 six months continuation bet, he must have aces. Chances are, I don't think you have exactly the same range that you raised it pre-flop, because pretty much everyone continuation bets these days. Uh, and so the next hand to look at here is ace nine off suit. If it had come round to you at this point and no one had raised it and there were a couple of limpers, you certainly could limp along, but you wouldn't want to raise uh, for very much the same reasons as you wouldn't want to raise the ace ten off suit, except this time you're more out of position and people have shown more strength because they've limped from earlier position. And again, it's even more likely you're just building the pot when you're out of position against multiple opponents. So it's not good enough to raise after the limpers, and what that means is, if it's not good enough to raise after people have limped, it's definitely not good enough to call after someone has raised. Uh, this is a really good spot, I think, to maybe talk about the gap concept. In essence, to call a pre-flop raise, because the punishment for having the second best hand is so huge in sit-and-go poker, you lose your tournament life, uh, you really need to be ahead of the majority of his range if he calls. It's no point... Even if you knew he was going to raise with all aces and, and all pocket pairs and maybe down to king-10, you still wouldn't want to call with ace-nine of suit because you're not far enough ahead of most of his range to do it, not to mention the fact you'll be out of position. Once someone raises, you should have a very, very tight range, particularly early on in the sit-and-go, with the exception of in a multi-way pot with a hand with lots of potential. Uh, it's going to be very hard to play it anyway, even if you called. I think this is a spot where, to be honest, you want to fold quite quite a lot, even though he raises a reasonable amount. He's raised a couple of limpers. I would be folding ace-10 off suit here. It would be a, a tough decision with ace-jack off suit. I think I'd probably have to fold that as well. What do you think? I'd be looking for ace-queen, 
plus. Uh, if I had pocket nines, uh, yeah, it's, that's a fairly difficult one. Tens, I might have to call and see what happened, considering his blue foot raise is quite high. Yep. But, I mean, you have the risk with a medium pair calling here in the small blind of not really knowing where you are. The only good thing is that, oh, there are a couple of limpers, so if they both call after you call, um, you are in a might-way pop with a, with a pair, obviously, so you know, there might be some implied there if you hit a set. Essentially, the here from the small blind, you should be looking to call tight. I mean, you know, the gap concept just explicitly states that you need a much better hand to call a raise than to raise yourself. And obviously, the even with a pocket pair, you probably wouldn't want to call just because he's raised it five times a big blind. So yeah, I suppose that does. You know, that, that is a big point. If the, you have a pair like fives here, he's raised far too much for you to be able to call and have you know decent implied odds. If he'd raised it to sixty, then uh, I probably would call with a pair of fives. But you know, yeah. Raised to 150 is far too much. And the reason is you have greater immediate pot odds and you have greater implied pot odds, the smaller his raises. And we get to ace jack suited, and, and there isn't really too much to say about this hand. You, if you have any thoughts of slow playing in a spot like this, it's really quite unwise. You're out of position, you're deep stacked. You have a good hand, you need to raise now because unfortunately chances are you'll have ace high on the flop. I think it's a pretty clear spot to raise. Again, there's no real need to get tricky early on. You don't want to think, I can limp this and then you won't expect I have the hand. Don't overthink your poker too much, eh? You've got a good hand, early blinds, raise it. And here... Here's the spot where this hand is a really clear fold. As a general rule, you never ever, ever want to really call a pre-flop raise with a rag ace in terms of just how your hand matches up with other hands. You're either a tiny favourite against hands like king-queen, king-jack, even eight, six of suit, or you're completely dominated by a better ace or a pocket pair. Uh, in terms of what hands you would be looking to call with here, well, you could make a case for calling with a hand like a pocket pair or, or a suited ace, but I think your case is somewhat weakened because, as Tom said earlier, those hands play well because they have a chance to hit something really big like a set or a flush, but they play well when you have good immediate odds, great implied odds, and in a multi-way pot. So when you look at the blinds here, even if you were to call, I think it's very unlikely the blind would call as well. So chances are it wouldn't be a multi-way pot. So this is actually a spot where you can be, you'd want to be fairly tight. Even those potential hands like pocket fours and things like that, you may want to still just fold. I would say my range here would be ace jack plus. If I've got ace ten off, um, even considering the opponent, I'm going to fold because if I do hit an ace on the flop and he's betting, I'm not actually that comfortable with my hand. Uh, in which case you're going to be in a difficult situation, deep stacked, and that's really where you don't want to be. Absolutely. And we get pocket sixes under the gun. You can raise here, you can fold here, but you certainly can't call here. Now if the blinds were 10-20 or 15-30, you could make a case for limping. You limp, maybe you start a cascade of limpers, that suits how your hand plays. But when the blinds get to 25-50, you pretty much never want to limp first in. And the reason is it's almost always worth raising instead because when the blinds are bigger, your raise amount is actually bigger. And people like, especially fish, tend to be less inclined to just call and see a flop. But also the blinds are worth stealing now. There's 75 chips in the middle now, so if you're going to play a hand, you might as well have a go at stealing that. Whereas when there's 30 chips in the middle, you're more thinking, how can I take someone's entire stack? Um, I don't know about you, Tom, but I always feel like once the blinds get to 25-50, you pretty much never want to limp first in. I would agree. And I'd also say that even at 10-20 uh, or 15-30, you will always pretty much want to raise first in. I mean, the, like Al said, the only exception really is when you're on a table full of fish and you have a hand like a small pocket pair under the gun. And you want to start, you know, a cascade of limpers. You know, you've seen how the table's been going. People, you know, have been limping a lot. There's not been that much raising, so you think you can get away with it. Obviously, you know, if you were to limp here with the sixes and someone raises behind you, you're going to be out of position, and you almost certainly have to fold them. So you might as well raise yourself. You know, you've got two chances of winning. Absolutely. So we raise, we get called by little stealth who's on the cripple stack, and we also get called from the small blind. And That's not a bad flop. 
Yeah, pretty good. Um, it's pretty rare you get this situation. So we talked about how you never really want to slow play when you're deep stacked. Well, you're not really deep stacked here anymore. You know, you have about two and a half times the size of the pot. And another thing to add to that, part of the reason you didn't want to slow play when deep stacked is because people could outdraw you and then win a lot of the chips that you had. Well, you're never going to lose this hand here. You can basically count this as a lock hand. You've got quads. I don't think he's going to have many outs to beat you. This is completely different to a spot with aces, where it was a dangerous board, your hand could have got outdrawn, you were deep stacked, so if you did get outdrawn you could lose a lot of chips. Here you're not deep stacked, and your hand is just so huge that the opponent has no outs. Um, I think so this is a, a point worth mentioning, is if the six of spades was in fact the ten of spades, I would still bet here, even with a set. Yes. Um, it's why I was saying I hate slow playing. You might think, I've got a really good hand, obviously I've got a set of sixes, you know, I'm definitely going to be best right now. But considering there's two hearts on the board, and if there was a queen ten, you know, there are going to be quite a few gut shots uh, and hands that have connected with that board, considering the opponent, you know, and what his, we think his range is going to be from the small blind. It's going to include um, a lot of hands, you know, that are two cards, ten or above. Um, and maybe some suit hands. So there's a lot of hands that are going to call you, and there's a lot of hands that could potentially outdraw you, even though you do stand to be you know, best right now. Absolutely. There'll be so three even with draws, the... flush draws, and both of those hands will be a bare set, as opposed to the quads you have now. Um, you know, with quads, you can happily check behind here because you have the hand so unlocked, but with a set um, on a draw-heavy board, you should definitely bet. I mean, the only time I wouldn't, bet a set here, in fact pretty much the only time I'm going to slow play in this situation is when I have quads or whether I have a set on a board like Ace-8-2 Ace, Ace eight, two Rainbow and you've got a set of aces, then it's fine to check behind. Um, in essence what you're saying is the only time you'll slow play is when you're not deep stacked and the opponent has no outs to beat you. Pretty much. Yeah, so I think actually checking is definitely going to be the best move here. And incidentally, I mean... The, the style of play that me and our play is that generally, you know, we're going to see bet 100% of the time if someone calls a raise and big blind uh, and then checks to us on the flop. So it, it may look a little bit strange to someone else in the hand who we play with regularly if we check behind. But against someone who uh, you haven't played often, who's not going to really take notice, then, you know, you can get away with it, with slow playing, even though to anyone else watching it would be blatantly obvious what you in fact have. Yeah. Uh, and here on the turn, it's very tempting to think the same reasoning applies, but the problem is, if you were to check behind here, you take away your chance of winning a really big pot, because you can't check behind here, and then if he checks the river, the most you're really going to be able to get out of him is another 250, 300. And let's say he had a hand like 10 king, 10 jack, a flush draw, you check behind here, you lose any chance of getting value from those hands, so... Even though the same reasoning still applies as on the flop, now it's a case of I need to get some value because if I check here, I'm just not going to get much. Um, having said that, because he doesn't look like he's got much and you don't have to worry about him outdrawing you, a very small bet is absolutely fine here. So at this point in time, you're betting 150. You're probably thinking that most of the hands you call with are going to call, uh, even the hand like, you know, ace-8 high may well call that about on the turn because it does look so weak. Absolutely. And then same thing on the river. The draws have all missed. Maybe he picked up a 9, put in a small bet. No joy. And unfortunately, that's usually the case when you flop quads. You don't get much value. Yeah, because you tend to just completely destroy the board. Um, there's not a lot that your opponents can have. So the next hand. 9 queen suited, facing a pre-flop raise. Um, the hand looks pretty. But it isn't, because although you know it looks like this guy seems to be raising a lot, this is why you want something like a heads-up display, so you can adjust your play to the opponent. He's only been raising 18% a hand, so he can't have been raising that wide. 9 queen suited is behind all of that range. I mean, before we even look at the fact that his stack size is such that if you're playing a hand here, you probably want to reship it. I think, first and foremost, it's worth understanding that just because it looks pretty doesn't change the gap concept. Fact of the matter is, your hand is probably behind his entire range, therefore you need to fold. It's very tempting to think it's suited, it's kind of connected, oh I've got, I've got 10 jack suited. That's not really how it works, you're going to be out of position with a hand behind all of his range, you know, you're, you should just let it go here. The situation changes if he min raises, I'd say, because then, then you've got, you know, um, half decent pods, 
Um, at the moment, you're getting 2.25 to 1, which, considering out of position, is not great. If he min raises, uh, you're going to be getting you know 3.5 to 1. That's true. You can consider flatting when he min raises. But here, with a standard raise size, it's a pretty clear, clear spot to just chuck it away. So, Ace King of Suit. Notice that the player in the small blind, um, you want to. He has a high VPIP compared to his pre flop raise, so that generally inclines that he likes to see a flop. So, you don't want to min raise it and let him just call. You want to raise a bit larger to encourage him to either re raise all in or fold. Uh, and the big blind has a lot of chips, and you have a reasonable amount of chips. You're fairly deep stacked. So, I, I like the full 3x raise here, makes it easier to try and get all of his chips. I mean, obviously, as the blinds get higher, you should uh, you should make your raise size in terms of big blinds less and less. But uh, at twenty five fifty, I think that the full three x here is good. I mean, my standard open would be to maybe one twenty five. But as Al said, considering the blinds, especially the small blind, he likes to call very often. You don't necessarily want him uh, to call that wide, considering that your hand is still a drawing hand. You know, ace king is light to end up with ace king high, and he is particularly aggressive. Yep. And the more the chips that go in pre-flop, the easier it is to just put in three solid value bets against someone who has maybe ace ten when you hit top pair and get and double up through the big blind. So you completely miss, but obviously considering he checks and he has a, ha had a history of check folding, you're definitely going to see bet here somewhere in the region of half the pot. Yeah, and, and the thing is, if you bet half the pot. Um, you need your opponent to fold one third of the time. If you bet half pot, they need to fold one in three times for you to show an immediate profit. So uh, you have to continuation bet, particularly because you've missed. Even if he check calls, it doesn't matter. You've got a chance to hit your two overcards. Um, if you don't see bet here, they can bet the turn. And unless you've hit an ace or a king, you're in a tough spot and you generally have to fold. So you have to continuation bet here because you've missed the flop. And it's a positive expectation spot to bet. If you bet here, if he folds one in three times, you show an immediate profit. He will fold one in three times. Almost everyone does. And it will likely mean that if he does have a hand like pocket nines, he check calls here and then checks the turn and you get to check behind. And by betting here, not only is it positive expectation, you expect to win chips and win money by betting here, you also pretty much make guarantee or make it very likely that you will get to see the turn and the river card. Whereas when you check behind, that player with a, a pair of nines or an ace eight will likely bet the turn and you'll have to fold or you risk getting yourself into some trouble. So half pot looks good. The fact of the matter is when you have the momentum and when you're the one betting, almost always your decisions are made much easier. It's when you have to start check calling uh, and you give someone else you know, the initiative, that's when you get put in tough situations. Mm -hmm. In fact, in in terms of actually check calling, if I play a hundred game session, I can honestly say I probably do it less than five times in those hundred games. You don't really want to be check calling much. You generally want to be betting or raising, uh, particularly when the pot gets to a reasonable size. So here, you know, he's called. You've got your information. He said well, he's got is, something. Yeah, he could well have a draw. He could well have a pair. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, your ace king high might still be best. I mean, you could say, well, you know, there's a lot of draws out there. He could well have a draw. Why don't I, you know, try and you know bet him off it or charge him for the draw? But you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, he's he's folded a few times previous, and you know, there's no real reason to uh, to put anything else into the pot. Yeah. Considering he called on the flop, I don't think he's gonna, you know, fold the turn here. Exactly. You had a huge amount of fold equity on the flop. Now that you know he's got something, your bet would have to be big because you're trying to make him fold a hand which has something. He's told you, I have a hand which has something, a straight draw, a flush draw, a pair. You have to bet, you're going to have to bet big to try and force him off it, and you don't really want to do that. You've got your answer. Um, well, the thing is, you know, your hand still has quite a lot of showdown equity in that, you know, if you get to a showdown and he has got a draw, your ace king high is almost certainly going to be best. So for that reason, you don't necessarily have to, you know, follow up this turn. If you, were looking to put in a, if you were looking to put in a, uh, you know, a turn bet here, I'd much prefer to do it with something that had absolutely no showdown value. So, you know, for instance, 2-3 off suit. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, it's worth mentioning that both Tom and I use a HUD where we have stats which show us how often someone folds the continuation bets on the flop. And then we have a, a pop-up we can use if they do call which shows 
having called a flop continuation bet, how often do they fold to the second barrel on the turn? Um, but the problem is, obviously, if you're not too used to using heads-up displays, you have to start off simply and add more and more stats as you get more and more comfortable. But here, easy check, river card, terrible card. I think this is the kind of card where if you'd have bet anything on the river, you would have to fold, even if it was small, because it's hit a lot of straight draws and it's hit the flush draw. You could, so you could make a case for betting here, considering the way he's played the hand um, is fairly weak. It oh. looks like he may well have a pair of sevens or eights. You would have thought that he would have bet the turn. Well, maybe not, actually. No, with a queen, he probably would have checked the turn, and now he's probably checked the river because, you know, it's a fairly scary card for him as well. Yeah, so. I think likely holdings are, you know, like a medium pocket pair, maybe a pair of eights, or probably most likely a weak pair of queens, like a queen jack or something like that. Or a hand like ace-eight. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's worth saying that, although it's tempting to think I can bet him off this hand here, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to try and bet him off, because uh, just because you know someone's hand doesn't mean you can make them fold. The guy looks fairly passive, he's probably fairly inclined to call you. I know it looks like there's no way you can possibly win this pot, and it does look like that, but just because you can't win the hand doesn't mean you have to bet. You would only want to bet 675 chips if you thought he was going to fold at least 50% of the time. The fact that your hand is very unlikely to win without you betting does not, is not a reason to bet. Only if you think that a bet will win you money, will win you chips should you bet. And I think it's quite unlikely that you will make him fold many of those hands that we talked about that he is likely to have. He could do, you could make a case for it, but I think he doesn't look that aggressive, he looks fairly passive. It, you did check the turn. Well this is the thing, anytime you're thinking of making a bluff you have to ask yourself the question, what hand am I representing here? And you know, the kind of hand you're representing here is either a straight or a flush. Well it's very unlikely that you, you would have raised with a five, so um, if I was in his position um, I'd be thinking, you know, he probably hasn't got a straight. In terms of how likely it is you have a flush, it's also particularly unlikely. The way that you've played the hand by betting the flop, checking the turn behind, and then betting the river is fairly strange. And if he was a thinking player, he would probably reason that you probably didn't have anything. Yeah, and correctly. So just because you're going to lose the pot if you check behind on the river does not mean that you should bet. And I think it's close, but this is a spot where you just check behind and let it be. Um, and it turned out he had a pair of eights. Well, you know, it's tempting to think that, wow, he had that hand, I should have bet, I should have bluffed him off it on the river, but to be honest, that was a very unlikely hand that he was going to be holding. It's very unlikely he was hold holding 8-10, much more likely he had a stronger hand. And he may not have folded 8-10 to a river bluff anyway, which is important to, to note. You know, you may think in his situation, I would fold that 8-10 to a river bet, but that doesn't mean he will, particularly if the opponent's a fish, because he's a fish and you're not, that's the difference between you two. And then we get to another part of sitting goes. Now, this is something which again varies from MTTs, well, not so much MTTs, but certainly from cash games, which is um, the blinds go up, people's stacks get short. It's very rare to find someone with six big blinds at a cash game, but in a sitting go, you know, it's really quite common because obviously the blinds go up, the pressure goes up, stack sizes decrease even though the number of chips someone holds stays the same. And you have to work out your calling range. And now here, this is a spot where you could easily think, alright, I reckon this opponent is going to be going all in with all aces, all pocket pairs, all good kings, a whole bunch of queens like queen 10 and queen 8 suited and, and jack 9 off suit. So my ace two suited is a, is a better hand than most of those hands. So I should call, because my pot odds aren't horrendous either. I've got 1.4 to 1. And that's not the right way of thinking about it, to be honest, because the problem with a hand like ace two, even though it is suited, is that when you're ahead, even though you may be ahead of most of the hands he's pushing, when you are ahead, when you, know, when you are up against jack nine suited, you're only a tiny favourite. Ace two suited is only a tiny favourite against jack nine suited. You're talking 55, 45. Whereas when he has pocket fives, or when he has ace ten, you're completely crushed. You're completely dominated. So although you're ahead of, you may be ahead, sorry, of most of the hands that he has. When you are ahead, you're a tiny favourite, and when you are behind, you're completely dominated. Uh, furthermore, you call here and you lose, you're down to push fold mode and a, a large, sort of when you're a professional, when you're looking to maximise how much money you make from a table, 
is you can avoid getting to push fold mode. It can, it does help. Uh, I think here this is still going to be a close one, but you would need to think your opponent was pushing pretty wide here to make this call. I mean, it's worth noting that any time you're considering calling an all-in, the only thing that, that matters are the opponent's range of hands that you think they're pushing and, you know, their stack size or essentially, you know, your pot odds. Uh, and once, obviously, the blinds go up and the number of players decreases, um, the ICM uh, factor, you know, in influences your decisions um, a lot more than it would have done at the early blinds. And so you have to take that into account, except it's fairly hard to take it into account you know, yourself. You actually kind of need a program that... Um, that helps you out with that, and that's where, you know, push fold on the bubble of a 6-max sit and go, um, you're really going to have to start using the sit and go wizard or some other ICM calculator well, I'm to glad, review your play. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm going to just bring it up now. And so here we see the wonderful program that is sit and go wizard. You know, as we said in the introduction, the main difference between sit and goes and cash gains and even sit and goes and MTTs to a large degree is the independent chip model. The fact of the matter is what will win you chips will often lose you a huge amount of money. So well, I don't say often but in some certain situations. In yeah. Generally when you it's get near the bubble. Making calls, for instance, that will win you chips and um, you know, or win you money in a cash game will actually lose you uh equity or you know, money in a sit and go. So let's assume that you thought your opponent was going to be pushing a range something like this. It seems reasonably reasonable. I mean, it's very hard to to estimate. That's a whole nother that's a whole nother video, estimating people's raising ranges. But if we looked at it like this, you would find that it wouldn't be correct to call here um, in terms of money. But if we were to plug it in in terms of chips, suddenly you find that you will actually win some chips. So this is actually, even though there isn't that much ICM pressure because you're not on the on the bubble, uh, this is an example of a move that will win you chips um, but won't win you money. And it, won't win you, it won't win you many chips, though. No, it won't win you many chips. It can't because it's ace, ace 2. It's hard to be much of a favourite against anything. You would really need him to think that he was pushing some slightly wider kind of range before you want to call here. Uh, it is entirely possible it could be a call. However, I haven't seen him ship before. It's uh, it's worth mentioning that the only thing we're looking at here is the, the diff percentage, which is the difference between um, the equity that it's assigned you from folding and the equity from, uh, from pushing, or in this case, calling is all in. So anything that's positive here uh, is going to win you. Uh, money in the long run, uh, and that's expressed as a percentage of the prize pool. So, you know, 0 0.05 is a, a particularly low number. Yeah. But it is still positive. So, if you was pushing that range, you could call here, and it it would make you money. It just isn't enough to overcome the uh, the edge percentage that Singo is assigned. Yeah, I won't go in too much into depth in it in this video because obviously, you know, sit and go with it. I'll, all I will say is that. You cannot be a good poker player, a good sit and go poker player, unless you understand ICM and you need a program like Sit and Go Wizard or Sit and Go Power Tools. And there's a few out there, but you need an ICM calculator, which is what it is, to help you make moves to work out what will win me the most money, not what will win me the most chips. Um, we won't spend too much time looking at it in this video, but it's important to have a program like this for situations just like this. So the very next hand, ace-8 suited. Uh, when you're against an opponent, blind versus blind, and your effective stacks are, you know, 10 or 9 or 8 or 7 big blinds, and by effective stacks I mean the lower stack that one of you two has. You have 16 big blinds here, but your effective stacks are 8 big blinds, because you can't risk more than 8 big blinds here, since that's all he has. Um, when your effective stacks are less than that, you pretty much only want to push or fold. You don't. You don't really do much else. Even limping is something you should rarely do in this spot. Uh, if your hand's good enough, you ship it. If it isn't, you fold it. And you can use a program like Sit and Go With to work out exactly what range you want to push. Um, we won't go into that into too much depth, but A8 suited is clearly going to be good enough to just ship. 
And Tom, you were talking about how generally your raise size gets lower as the uh, as the blinds go up. Well, here's a good example of it. There's no need to raise the full 300. Uh, as we've seen, the guy called with 10-8 off suit before when we raised a full 3x. If he's going to call, he's probably going to call. He likes to see flops with certain hands, uh, and it's just too much of our stack to risk. And one thing that's important to talk about is when you are, particularly at the late game, when, you, when your effective stack sizes are getting to, you know, 18 big blinds, 17 big blinds, and less, all the way down to, you know, 8 and, eight and 9 big blinds, you need to have a plan for what you're going to do if each opponent ships. So before you make this raise, you need to know, what am I going to do if the small blind goes all in? What am I going to do if the big blind goes all in? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, if the person who's going to be reshipping on you has 9 big blinds or less, you're going to call. Uh, but hypothetically, if you were planning on folding for some reason to the small blinds reship, you would want to use that information to adjust your pre-flop raise. You'd say, well, hang on, if I'm going to fold to this person and, and that person if they ship, there's no point risking an extra 50 chips. I might as well just min-raise it. Assuming that you know the change in your raise size isn't going to affect their decision dramatically. True. True. But yeah. essentially, it, it is like a, a bit of a, a game of chess here, in that when you do make a raise, you're considering all the possible situations, um, you know, all possible future events, and what you're going to do um, if they happen. So, you know, like Al said, you know, he's going to raise 250 here. Uh, if a small blind goes all in because he's only got seven big blinds, your pot odds are going to be such that even with a rag ace, you're going to have to call. You might not like it, but I mean, your pot odds will be such that you're going to have to call. He may well have a hand like King Jack, in which case you are going to be a a small favourite, but um, if the if the big blind decides to re-raise, obviously considering his stack size, you're going to fold. Absolutely. If you make a raise and someone reships and it comes back to you and you're not sure what to do and you're like, oh, I've got good pot odds, should I call, should I not? You've made a mistake because those questions should have been answered before you even put in that raise. You should know the answers to those questions in your head before that situation comes up, before you even decide on how big to make your pre-flop raise. I would say that, you know, once they go the blinds go up to 50, 100, um, you will rarely want to raise it three times the big blind. Yes. Um, it will almost certainly be somewhere between min and 250. Okay. But, I mean, uh, other good reasons to raise slightly more with a hand like ace-4 is that because it doesn't play that well, Post flop, I you know you end up with ace high, a weak ace high on this board. You may want to make it slightly more, say two fifty rather than two hundred pre flop because of the added fold equity. Yeah, a hand. Yeah, that's a very very good point. You want someone to fold more with a hand like ace four because it's harder to have a good hand on the flop. Whereas if you have a hand like queen king suited, you can have straight draws, flush draws, not to mention high pairs. It's easier to play, so you don't mind as much if they call. Um, on this flop, decided to check behind. I think it's fair to say that continuation betting would be completely acceptable. Um, however, it's very hard to represent a hand on this flop. And the opponent is passive. If you look at his aggression factor, he, he's fairly passive. Which means that you would expect that if he doesn't have a hand, he will check the turn and then you can happily bet and take it down. Um, it's I, worth mentioning, actually, sorry, that... I, that you know, we say you should almost always continuation bet, which is true. But however, in this situation, you are trying to exercise a little bit of pot control. Uh, maybe only have one bet go in, or you know, in that, in the way of checking behind the flop. Obviously, there's only two streets for that one bet to go in. But in addition, you do have some showdown value. You have ace high. Your hand may well be best at the moment. If you had a hand like nine ten off suit, you should be more inclined to bet here. Yeah, because your only way of winning the hand really would be to get your opponent to fold. Having said that, continuation betting here, I think, you know, neither you or I, Tom, would say that that was a bad move at all. No. Uh, you could certainly continuation bet here. If your opponent is passive, he's more likely to call your continuation bet, but he's also more likely to check the turn as well when he doesn't have a hand, because passive players don't really bluff, but they do call when they have any value. So, since you know that if you bet, he's more likely to call... Yet, he's more like, if you check, he will check the turn when he doesn't have a hand. You can often delay your continuation bet. Say, so, well, this opponent, his check doesn't actually tell me as much as it would for someone else because he's very likely to call. But when he checks twice, which he will very likely do when he has nothing, I know that if I put in a bet then, I'm very likely to take the pot down. That's the reasoning. Uh, Sorry, go on. Well, I say, and, you know, 
last point of about six is that uh, <laughs> you've got to consider how previous hands have gone down with this particular guy. You have raised in late position quite often, and he's called for the big blind fairly often. And the last time um, you made a C-bet, he called you, uh, and then you checked it down to the river, uh, and he had a pair of eights, and he won. So he'll, he'll know that you're not necessarily betting this flop, you know, with a pair or, you know, uh, a particularly strong hand, potentially, if that, he's paying attention. That is a brilliant point. That is indeed. So it's one more reason to check behind. Absolutely. And then great card on the turn. This is actually a fantastic ha card. It, it may look scary, but if he had an eight, he was already beating you. Now there's one less eight in the deck. And the kicker in your ace doesn't come into play. Now you have two pair and an ace kicker. So if your opponent was holding ace nine off suit, you're now splitting with him. This eight is a fantastic hand, uh, a fantastic card. It has not. It's made it less likely you're beaten. Indeed. Um, you could say, well, that's a reason to check, and you you could check, you could check, but stick with the plan. You've got a lot of fold equity here. It looks like um, you don't. You want to charge him to outdraw you, even if he has queen jack off suit. The fact of the matter is he's very likely to fold here. Even if he calls, you're getting value. Your hand is really strong. The only likely hand that, that he could have, which would be, it would be an 8, because it's unlikely he would have called a preflop raise with a 2. So your hand is actually really strong on this board. Uh, but it is also vulnerable, because it's, you know, any card which makes him a pair, your hand is beaten. So I think there's good reason to bet for that. Because you do want to protect it. There are some flush draws he may call a bet with. Um... So, you know, it, it, there are good reasons to bet here. I definitely would have to bet. Uh, also, in addition, betting here serves the purpose of if he checks to you on the river, you happily check behind, whereas if you check behind the turn and he puts out, say, the size of the pot on the river, it's going to be a fairly difficult call for you. Yeah, this way... Whereas you, you can be control. fairly happy that you've put your one bet in for the hand. If he bets the river, obviously you're going to fold, but if he checks, you happily check behind with a lot of uh, showdown value. Yeah, and the line that you take here... This is, again, one of those where when you're thinking about your own play and your own card, you don't notice it. But to the opponent, you normally continuation bet, yet you didn't bother here when it's very unlikely he has a hand because it's a, a dry flop. Suspicious. And then you put in a tiny bet again. Very suspicious. He's going to be really worried that you have a big hand. So he's very unlikely to, to bet the river, although he did do here. But he's going to think that there is a possibility that you have got a very strong hand. Uh, this is an actual. This is a very interesting bet actually, because obviously he's bet a fifth of the pot. You're getting almost six to one, which are great pots. You've got to think that you're going to win more than one in seven times uh, in order to be able to uh, to make this call here on the river with ace high. Mm -hmm. But I would say that even though your pots are that great, there are so few hands that you're beating. And I mean, what do, his aggression is that low that I would say, even with these great pot odds, I may have to fold this ace high here. Considering the line he's taken, he does look like he at least has... Well, he might have picked up a pair of tens. He might have a flush draw. I mean, what hand it's, can you beat that you know he's betting here? It's very, very hard to fold against the fish when you, when you only need to win one in seven times. Um, well, I, I, know. I know what the point you're making is. It's hard to know. You could almost say, I'm, I'm calling for... For, for a split here. Uh, you could make a case for folding. But then again, the kind of fish who will call that turn bet with 9-10 high may well put out a stupid bet like that on the river. True. Um, the yeah, hand yeah. When, you're, when you're getting good pods, you know, it's a good a point you made, obviously. It, it's very hard to to neglect them. If you're getting 6-1 six, six to one on the river, um, most of the time, if you've got some sort of a hand and you, you, know, you got to the river, you're going to call. Absolutely. So, the next hand of note, ace-8 suited here, the guy ships under the gun, and in contrast to the ace-2 suited hand, now your pot odds are much better, and your hand is stronger. And it's actually a fairly easy call. Not really much to say about that hand, if being honest. Not too much, but it does lead nicely into this bubble, and on the bubble, ICM is a huge factor and it can make you do very strange things to maximize how much money you're going to make from a tournament. Uh, for example, here, this ace-8 ace of suit, normally you'd think, well, I definitely want to raise it here, of course I want to raise, but you are the middle stack, the top two places pay out, and you have a clear advantage over the short stack. 
Furthermore, your opponent in the big blind, he likes to call pre-flop raises. We've seen him do it with 10-9, 10-8. So you don't have much fold equity. And that means you're very likely that if you raise, you know, he may fold, but you may well just be building the pot out of position as the middle stack on the bubble against a passive opponent who you're not going to be able to take the pot from. When you look at it like that, your hand doesn't really matter. There's no good way to do it. Um, he's unlikely... Essentially, Sorry, go on. I mean, you're on the bubble and you're the middle stack. You're out of position. To be able to get involved with the big stack in a big pot, um, i.e., you know, raising it pre-flop, you're starting to build a big pot, you're going to need a significant edge. And a hand like Ace-8, most of the time it would give you that edge, but in this particular situation, it is best to try and keep the pot as small as possible pre-flop against this particular opponent. If you've got a hand like pocket 10s, then obviously you're going to raise, but Ace-8 off just isn't quite good enough. It doesn't quite give you that edge you need in order to better get involved, um, you know, to start building a big pot out of position in this situation, considering there is a short stack there who's only got 11 big blinds. Yeah, and if you raise, he's likely to call. But if you limp, he's not that likely to raise. So even though you've got Ace-8 offsuit, limping is the way forward. Stick in a bet on the flop, try and get some value. No joy. And we said that ICM applies most on the bubble. And it can make you do some very, very strange things. And here's a great example. I would say that most everyone would think this is a great spot to just ship it back over the top. And, you know, you look at your own hand and you say, yeah, for sure, how can I not? But you need to think of the overall situation. There is a really short stack guy there. You're very likely to make the money, so long as you don't tangle with the big stack. And when you add to that the fact that the big stack has not raised very often at all, he's not been using his big stack to bully you, and just generally he seemed tight. Um, you know, you're still probably well ahead of his range. But if you re-raise all in, because he's raised so rarely and he's clearly quite passive and he likes to call, there's a good chance that even if he has a hand like Ace-8, he will call your re-raise all in. Even if he has a hand like Queen-King, he might call your re-raise all in. So even though you'd win lots of chips by re-raising all in here, you would, well not certainly, but you may find that it's more profitable for you to manage the size of the pot, to not risk busking, busting on the bubble and to call. And it works really well because this is the opponent who looks like he has a tight opening range, so he's going to have a strong hand. He's, he has a high VPIP, so chances are he's going to call you when you reship. And he's passive post-flop, which means that he's not necessarily going to try and take the pot away from you. He's the kind of guy who, if he has ace-king, maybe you'll just go check-check, 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 and your pocket nines will win. And you'll never have risked getting busted out in third place and not making the cash. And I think the biggest point here is that the shorter the short stack gets, um, the more of an edge you need in order to be able to tangle with the big stack here, especially for an all-in confrontation. I mean, the point is that if you were to go all in here and the big stack were to call you, you would, you know, potentially double up. But doubling up would not, although it would double the amount of chips that you would have in your stack, it wouldn't double the amount of equity, i.e. the amount of dollars that you expect to win from the tournament. Absolutely, yeah. So you need to have a much greater edge than you think in order to be able to, uh, to tangle with the big stack as the stack on the bubble. To show how much difference it makes, if, um, if the guy in the small blind who'd folded here, his name is rcanby 20 if he had 2,600 chips, you would probably just want to re-raise all in here. But as a middle stack, you know, for your tournament life, up against the big stack, yep. you have to be fairly tight. He looks like the kind of tight. guy who will call your re-raise all in, and maybe won't pressure you post-flop if you just flat. I mean, nines are an excellent hand, and most of the time I would probably want to re-raise this, but considering the opponent, I think you know, the line of just calling here is probably the best way. If you have a hand like pocket jacks, then obviously you're going to have to re-raise all in because, you know, they're just far good too point. strong. Very good point. Um, a hand like pocket sevens, I would look to just fold. I'm going to be folding a large part of my range against this guy as a middle stack. I mean, the, the biggest point is, if you haven't heard of ICM before, if the big stack was to shove on the button here, and you had ace-king, you would if definitely you knew have to he fold was shoving in the big Almost part. every single hand, even if you knew he was shoving 9-2 suited as part of his range, you would still have to fold the ace-king. Yeah. And post-flop, here is a good example against this opponent. He looks fairly passive, there's no need to build the pot, you want to do what you can to keep the pot as small as possible. Um, so you check. He checks. Good card on the turn. Pot control, pot control, pot control, pot control. 
you check, he checks. This is a good reason why flatting works against this opponent, because we've seen he's fairly passive. He's only going to bet if he has a hand. Queen on the river, you check, he checks. And he had jack 10. And you never know, you would have reshipped, he might have called you there. You'd have risked your tournament life on a coin flip. In fact, he might have been a very small favourite with jack 10 suit. So the bubble continued. If we were to go through every bubble hand, I, I'd love to do it, but... I'd be here all day talking about it, you know, there's so much to talk about with the bubble. And this is generally aimed to be a general overview of sit and go play. So we've skipped it forward. Uh, and it's, he's made the same raise as when you had the nines, but this time your hand is that much stronger. Aces is obviously the hand to have. So you want to re-raise it. And there's no need to make your re-raise very big at all. You could even make it smaller than this because you're not deep stacked. Yes, it's a bubble, but your hand's so strong, even if you raise it to 950 and he calls, all the chips will realistically be going in on the flop. Um, and I would say that um, the situation is different from the last time with the nines because of the fact that there is no longer really a short stack. You're all essentially even stacked on this bubble. If the guy in the small blind had 750 chips, I would want to raise it slightly yes. more with the aces. Um, because you wouldn't necessarily want the guy to call and, you know, pick something up and then you get it all in, not as a big favourite. But considering, you know, there isn't that much ICM pressure uh, for you to re-raise it large as the medium stack, you can afford to make a slightly smaller yep. re-raise. Who are the aces? It's and just something to be thinking about. You cool. And he had ace four, and I think, you know, if he's doing that with ace four, there's a good chance he'd have done it with the king ten or the ten jack suited, or even if he had had ace four when you had the pocket nines he might have done it then he might have called the all in then uh, he's that kind of opponent and i think that's good i mean it's easy to win or to do well in a sit and go when you get dealt aces a couple of times and then we get down to the heads up and we're not going to go through the heads up on this video because in reality heads up are completely different from the rest of the sit and goes and the reason why they are is because there is no icm uh, the one thing that really should be taken out from this video is Sit and goes differ from cash gains because of ICM. Sit and goes differ from MTTs because of how much of a difference ICM makes in a sit and go. And people often think, if you've heard of it, you think maybe it only applies on the bubble. Well, it should affect how you play all the hands. That's kind of what you wanted to get from this. Heads up are completely different. There's no ICM pressure. You're just basically playing one on one. Anything that wins you chips will win you money. As a result, you should be ruthlessly aggressive. It's a completely separate part of the game. Uh, and a topic for a completely different video, I think. Uh, and the reason why it, uh, ICM doesn't matter in Heads Up is that essentially um, you are just playing for the difference um, in prize money between first and second place. So each chip is worth a specific value of money. Whereas obviously if there's three of you left, whoever goes out third gets no money. Hence why ICM applies. But Heads Up Yeah, so first place $100, second place gets you $60. If you have half of the chips, those chips are worth $20 in, in essence when you're thinking about decisions. So let's have a look at, at what we've picked up from this video. So what are the major sit and go concepts that are important to know to maximize how much money you can make? Well the first one is Slansky's gap concept. Because doubling up in essence doesn't double how much money you expect to win, you need to have an edge to get involved in a big pot, and that means that you need to use Sklansky's gap concept. Uh, it's generally true in cash games, but the extent to which you need a better hand than your opponent's raising range is much larger in certain goes. If someone's raising, it doesn't matter if you're beating some of his range, you need to be beating the majority of his range to call or re-raise. You need very strong starting hand requirements when someone has shown strength, particularly at the early blinds. That means that, in essence, you should play tight from the blinds when someone raises. Even though you may have queen-10 suited, most of the time it's worth just folding. Absolutely. So you need to respect the strength of your opponent's raises. And, and at the early blinds, you really only want to see flops when you have a premium hand where you're doing the betting and the raising and you're really knocking people out of the pot, you're, you're charging them to try and outdraw you. Or when you have a hand which can win you a big pot, can, can let you double up. A hand like pocket fours, which will be easy to play post-flop, so it will be easy to multi-table while doing it, 
uh, where you try and get as many opponents as possible and you get in for cheap with a chance to take someone's entire stack if you hit your set. The same thing holds true with uh, you know, suited aces, rag aces, if you can get in cheap with lots of opponents, then if you hit your flush you're probably going to get paid off. Big pots are for big hands. If you end up in an enormous pot at the early blinds and you've got a pair of aces with a 10 kicker for top pair, medium kicker, you've probably done something wrong along the way. You need a big edge to get involved in a big pot early on. This is why you need these starting hand requirements. Big pots are for big hands. And I think it's worth saying that you can't win a sit and go early on. You can only lose it, hence why you need such a big edge. That's why you'll see a lot of turbo players, uh, at least some of them, will play tight, 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 and then push fold. And the reason why they win money is because they don't make any mistakes, really, at the early blinds. Even though they're not maybe maximizing uh, the amount of money they're going to make or the amount of chips they're going to make from playing a few more hands at the early blinds, they make up for it from having a solid push fold game. And an understanding of what I mean. Once you're involved in a big pot, as a general rule, don't just be calling raise or fold. When the pot's big, um, there's more value in protecting your hand because there's more chips which you're trying to win in the middle. So when the pot is huge, don't be looking to call if it's going to mean the pot is bit bigger than your remaining stack. Um, once in a big pot, if you followed the right steps, you should have a very solid hand. It should be fairly easy to play. Generally, you want to raise or fold. You don't want to do too much calling apart from on the river. And very, 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 very important, don't slow play when deep stacked. When you have a strong hand, pre-flop, don't slow play it. On the flop, if there's any chance of any vulnerability, don't slow play it. And when you're deep stacked, even if you've got the monster nuts, don't slow play, because you need to start building the pot to try and win a very big pot. Uh, just as a general rule, you don't really slow play when you are deep stacked. Notice that we call deep stack anything more than 20 big blinds, which I'm sure is um, slightly different to say what a cash game player yep, would call true. deep stack. I just want to make that point, you know. When we say deep stack, we mean, you know, you've got more than about 15, 20 big blinds. Uh, and those are the main concepts that we want to take from this video. We will continue doing the video series. We'll look at things like variance and bankroll management, common mistakes, how to increase your hourly rate with certain playing styles and little techniques that can help it, how to look at the game in a professional way. Uh, and things like that. But those are for future videos, so that's the first one for now. So, that's this video. Next time we'll be having a look at kind of the common mistakes that you see professional or semi-professional or up-and-coming players make. And we'll look in-depth at them and how it relates to understanding when you can pass up a marginal spot, because there might be a better opportunity. How to really understand table selection to maximise how much money you make. Variance, it's so important to understand variance, that way you know when you're really going on a bad run you can judge with more accuracy when you're playing well, when you're playing badly. Thinking outside the box to make positive EV moves. Um, just looking at kind of situations where it might be correct to make a play which you think might be kind of stupid. You know, you learn certain to play certain hands from certain positions in certain ways. And we'll look at when you should maybe deviate from that because you need to to make money. How to look at the red line or your all-in adjusted EV line on holder manager or poker tracker to really understand it. A lot of people seem to seem to think it is a perfectly true reflection of how you should be doing, uh, which is not the case. And last, but certainly not least, in fact, most important in my opinion, uh, how to play happily and profitably for many years. So that's everything that will be on the video next week. I hope that you found this video useful, I hope it's been enjoyable, I hope you picked up a few things from it. And until next week, uh, goodbye from me, Al McLenaghan. And me, Tom Luce. And we'll see you next time.